Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, and he says, and when you pray. Did you notice that Jesus didn't say, and if you pray? He starts off taking it absolutely for granted that you will pray because this is the birthright of every Christian to talk to God and pray. I love the fact that he just assumes that we're going to do it. He says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Now, guys, don't slip past that before thinking about that and talking to God about that because you know what? That's a privilege. That is is a privilege. You know, the patriarchs knew God as the Almighty. And Moses knew God as the I Am. And the Israelites knew God as Jehovah Yahweh. But because of what Jesus Christ came to do on the cross, for you and I, we get to know God as Papa. That was unheard of. Unheard of! You're calling God your father? Hey, whenever Jesus did that, they wanted to pick up rocks and kill him. That's not, you can't call God your father. Yeah, but you and I can because of what Jesus, of course, Jesus had the unique opportunity because as the unique and only begotten son of God, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, you and I can call him father. Let me ask you a question. You think everybody can call God father? Anybody who wants to? See, that's what makes reciting the Lord's Prayer such a travesty. Not everybody can call God Father because he is not everyone's Father. You know, you hear people say all the time, we're all just children of God. No, we're not. That's not what the Bible says. Let me show you what the Bible says. John chapter 1, it says, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name. What did he do? He gave the right to become children of God and to call God Papa. Not anybody can just say, he's my father. You have to be saved. You have to be born again. You have to have received him and believed in his name. We went through that kind of symbolically in communion just this morning. And if you did that today, maybe you even did it for the first time today, you have the birthright to call God Papa, to come to him in that very unique and loving and intimate way. But not everybody does. In fact, I I'm willing to bet there are people in this room that don't have the right to call God Father because they have not yet received him, truly received him. So you see, you, we're made children of God. We're not born naturally children of God. We're born supernaturally as children of God. And that happens when we receive Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. So, very important thing. What are we then to do? And, you know, so we spend some time just rejoicing, just reveling in the fact that he's our father. And then what does he go on to say here? Then we're to say, hallowed be your name. And the word hallowed, your Bible may say holy. It's, that's what it means. It, it's a word for holy. And, and you know what we sang this morning? Did you guys, you guys, were you singing today during worship? I, hope, I thought it was a sweet time of worship this morning. We were singing holy, holy, holy. Do you know that's what the angels say? Day and night, they never stop before the throne of God saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. It's worship. What is he telling us? Come and worship God. Come and worship your Father. Come and worship at his throne. In fact, we're, that's the way we're supposed to come to God. Look at Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter his gates. How? With complaints? No, with thanksgiving, praise, and his courts with praise. That's how we're to enter in. So we don't come to God just going, God... We come and we say, Lord, you are holy. Father, you are holy. Holy is your name. We worship you. Have you ever wondered why we start off the service with musical worship? Did you think it was just because we wanted to create a neat way for people who came in late to not have to kind of make a scene? That's not it at all. 
We are to do this very thing. We're to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We come to worship and praise, and then we get into the word for a little while and that sort of thing, and, and it's exactly the way the Bible would, would have us to do it. Jesus is telling us here in the, in, in the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father, Father, I come to you. I'm your son. You are holy, holy. You're a holy God. And when you pray according to this guideline, you just start worshiping the Lord. You just spend some time just, oh, just, I'm just going to meditate on your holiness. You are ho and you know, I know you want to bring holiness into my life too. And I and you start talking to him about that stuff, you know. Next, he says in verse 10, look with me in your Bible. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the meat of prayer right here. This is the, this is the center. This is that, that chewy nugget, <laughs> like they say about Tootsie Pops. This is, this is the center. This is what you're getting to, right? It's to get down there and get to the, the, the brass tacks. We have been given the privilege of praying the kingdom of God and the will of God down here on earth. Okay? It's a privilege. And do you, know what, do you know what's going on down here? This is the kingdom of man, and it's ruled by Satan. The Bible says he is the temporary ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the Bible calls him. And it's a temporary rulership, believe you me, and he's going down and he knows it. But he still has this temporary rulership, this malevolent rulership set up here, and you and I are affected by it every day. It affects our lives, it affects our hearts, it affects our minds, it affects our marriages, it affects our children, it affects everything about our lives, and you and I are given the privilege of taking the very kingdom of God. And by the way, where there's a kingdom, there's got to be a king, otherwise not a kingdom. You are praying the kingship, the throne, the rulership of God into that situation. So, so you're praying about your family. Father, you were saying, I, I, I pray that, you would, that you'd be crowned over this situation. I pray that you would rule over this thing in my family. You know. That's what you're praying. You're praying, God, I give you the freedom to rule. I pray for your will to be accomplished. Now rule, reign, bring your majesty into this thing. I know Satan's had his hands in this thing, and it's a mess. But now I'm asking for your rulership. And we cry out to God, and we say, bring your, your kingdom here on earth. Let it be done here as it is done there. That's what we're told to do. And yeah, that's a wrestling match. But it's important. And, and, and it's a privilege then he says in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. You're not just telling you to pray for a loaf of bread. Your daily bread is whatever you need. It might be bread, but it might be patience. It might be forgiveness. It might be strength, kindness, whatever, victory. God, whatever I need, that's your daily bread. But I want you to see something very important here. It's called your daily bread. It's not called your monthly bread. Right? Or your yearly bread. It's your daily bread. You know why? We get back to that thing called relationship. God wants to have a relationship with you. And so, you know what? He's put this, there's this spiritual rule that we saw that got started way back in the days of manna in the desert. And here it is. What God gives you today is going to stink by tomorrow. It's going to be perfect for yesterday. But you try to hold it over to today, it's going to be stinky and full of maggots. And here's why. Because God wants you to come to him today. He wants you to come to him every day for a new, fresh supply. Give us this day what we need, our daily bread, whatever that may be. What, what is your need? You know what you probably know what your needs are. You know? God, here's what I need. I need it today. And I'm not asking for tomorrow. I'll come to you tomorrow and I'll ask about that. But for today, I need this. And I need it. And he'll provide it. And he's not intimidated to hear you ask. And then he says in verse 12, and forgive us our debts. Or your Bible may say sins. It does say sins in Luke's account of this. Same thing. Kind of depends on the audience you're talking to. But he says, I love this. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven 
the debts of others. <laughs> That's a trick. I don't know if you, if you, you like that or not, but you've been tricked. He told you, he told you to, to, to ask God that he would measure to you forgiveness based on the measure you use for others. Let me ask you a question. If God measured forgiveness to you the way you measured it to others, would you be forgiven at the end of the day? That's what he's challenging you and I to do. And in this challenge, in this prayer, is to keep our hearts open to God and keep our hearts open to others that we might have our heart open to God. And we're saying, Father, forgive me. Forgive me in accordance with how I forgive other people. You got somebody in your life that you're kind of mad at and you're kind of smoldering under the surface about? Give it up, man. It's, you know, being mad at somebody is the dumbest thing in the world. It really is. Holding on to unforgiveness, it's like, it's like drinking poison and thinking it's going to hurt the other person. It's just really, really dumb. And so give it up. Give it to God. You know, just lay it at his feet and just say, you know what? I give this to you in the name of Jesus. I, I just, I don't have what it takes to forgive this person, but I believe you do. In fact, you know what? I know right now I'm praying to the one who hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And now you live inside of me. And that very power to forgive now resides inside of me. And I'm going to start letting it out. And I'm going to let you do that work inside my heart to forgive others. Yeah, even that person that hurt me so badly. Finally, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or literally the evil one. It can actually be either way. Jesus tells us in this last part of this prayer that he wants you and I to be mindful, to pray about steering clear about those things that might otherwise lead us into temptation or, you know, whatever, and to lead us and to steer us clear of the enemy who often loves to do the tempting. But please understand, people. This prayer, Lord, lead me not into temptation, deliver me from evil, it assumes that you're also, you know, not recklessly putting yourself in the path of temptation and, and, and making yourself liable to the enemy's attack by, by just kind of living a foolish existence. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like, like me driving. And I used to do this. I'm ashamed to say it, but when I was a teenager, I was a total speed freak, and I'm not talking about drugs. I'm talking about the kind of stuff that what went through my veins was gasoline. And I would put my foot on the pedal, and I just loved going fast in my car. I mean, I just did. And I lived in rural Minnesota, and I could get away with driving about 115 miles an hour and not getting caught. I don't know how I lived through my teenage years. I have no idea. And it is the dumbest thing in the world. And I used to drive 115 miles an hour down the road and say, God, please protect me. <laughs> Somewhere in the back of my head, I can hear God going, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, but it, it's, it's like, you know, here I am living this reckless, foolish existence, but I'm crying out to God to protect me. You know, and there's an assumption here that you and I are going to live wisely. That we're going to make good decisions, you know what I mean? That we're going to like, we're going to kind of cooperate. The, the, the Bible says, Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, listen, don't give the devil an opportunity. Stop giving the devil opportunities. He's walking all over your back, but you're letting him because you're doing things that open the door. That's what, you know, you got to be, you know, live smart. But as you're living smart and so forth, even, even after you've lived dumb, you can still come to God and just say, deliver me. I mean, he'll still do it even though you're the one that got yourself into the mess. Do you know that? Do you know you can still cry out to God and say, deliver me, deliver me from evil, deliver me from the evil one? He'll still do it. He won't. God is so cool. He won't sit back and go, no, you got yourself into that one, dude. You're getting yourself out by yourself. He just, he's not that petty. In fact, he's not petty at all. He, he loves you so much, he'll let you go, hang yourself, and he'll be right there in time to cut the rope before it snaps your neck. He is so cool. So you can still cry out to God. And he wants you to. So we need to start praying for God to deliver us. <laughs> deliver me from evil. Do you know what Christians do nine times out of ten? They don't pray that prayer. Do you know Christians often don't pray that prayer? Deliver me from evil. What they do is they work it out themselves. They get into a bind and they just work it out themselves. And sometimes God lets them do it, and it'll work. But what happens is they're in a pattern now, you see. They're in a pattern of figuring out their own answers to their own problems. And they may, they may pray, and they say, God, deliver me, and then they just go out and work their own deliverance. 
And then they get into another bind, and it's that much easier just to go work out their own deliverance. And then they get into another bind, and pretty soon they're not even coming to God anymore because they never really stopped to wait for him to deliver them in the first place. And some of us can be pretty smart about the way we get out of our problems. problem is someday you're going to hit a brick wall, and you're going to come up against a situation you can't do anything about, and you're going to be so accustomed to fixing it yourself that you're going to find a whole new voice with which to cry to God on that day. And you'll be crying buckets and wondering why in the world you didn't start taking God at his word, trusting him with all of your heart, and leaning not on your own understanding, but instead in all your ways acknowledging him and letting him do the work of deliverance. There's a wonderful proverb that says, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory is in the hands of the Lord. In other words, you and I can fight a good fight, but at the end of the day, it's God who wins the battle. And he's the one who's going to bring deliverance into our lives. You know, in the, final, in the final analysis, it's not you, it's not me, it's him. So he says, come to me, cry out to me for deliverance. I like to do that. I like to deliver my children. You in a tough spot today? Cry out to God. Cry out to God. Trust Him with all of your heart. Get your hands off the problem. And get on your knees and pray and trust God with all of your heart. And listen, it's going to be the toughest wrestling match you may ever get into, but it'll be worth it because you're going to learn how to depend on the power of that is behind this entire universe. And nothing will be too difficult for you because nothing is too difficult for him. Any of you guys remember watching Captain Kangaroo? Okay, you'll have to be gray, probably. Come on, Captain Kangaroo, come on, guys. Show it for the captain, here we go. All right. Um, some of you kids uh, won't remember this because it was in black and white. I can't remember exactly if it was in black or white or if my parents just wouldn't put up for a color TV. I'm not really sure which it was. But anyway, there was this scene in Captain Kangaroo where they would wake up Grandfather Clock. Some of you guys remember this. Grandfather Clock was a grandfather clock. And, and Captain Kangaroo would go over and say, oh, Grandfather Clock is sleeping. And he'd say, do you kids want to help me wake up Grandfather Clock? And he'd say, one two, three, and I, me, just like every other kid in America, probably about five years old, looking at the TV going, wake up, grandfather clock, you know, and then his eyes would flutter open and they'd have this little conversation. And, you know, as a kid, I probably thought I was really doing it, you know. But, it, but, but to hear some people pray, it's kind of like they're doing the wake up grandfather clock sort of a thing with God. It's like we got to pray, we, we got to get his attention because, you know, I think he's sleeping here. And I'm not really sure he is clued in to what's happening here. You know what? Jesus reminds us that our Heavenly Father knows our needs before we ask. He knows exactly what you need. And you don't have to wake him up. You don't have to make him aware. You don't have to inform him about what's going on in your life or not going on in your life. He knows. He knows infinitely more about that situation than you do. And, and so this might, in some of your minds, raise a question of its own, and that is, if God already knows us, our needs, why do we have to pray? I mean, doesn't that kind of make prayer unnecessary? If God already knows my needs, then why does he ask me to come to him in prayer? thought long and hard about that one, and eventually I read a quote that I thought did it better than I could possibly do. And even though I have some disagreements with some of what this man thinks theologically, there's a quote by John Calvin that I just got to share with you today because it's so good. Look at this. He writes, believers do not pray with the view of informing God about things unknown to him or of exciting him to do his duty or urging him as though he were reluctant on the contrary, they pray in order that they may arouse themselves to seek him, 
that they may exercise their faith in meditating on his promises, that they may relieve themselves from their anxieties by pouring them into his bosom in a word that they may declare that from him alone they hope and expect, both for themselves and for others, all good things. <sighs> Isn't that good? Isn't that a great quote? I mean, I couldn't have possibly tried to say it any better. We pray as a reminder that we're trusting God with our lives. We pray to arouse in ourselves that faith that looks to him and looks to him alone as the source of every good thing in our lives and the lives of those who we are praying for. I love this quote. But he says here, you know, we don't, we don't pray uh, to try to excite him to do his duty or to urge him as though he were reluctant. Once again, you listen to some people's prayers and it sounds like, well, it's kind of telling, you know. It kind of sounds like they feel like they need to kind of get God worked up a little bit in order to, to respond to their need, you know. It's like we have to kind of convince him that this is a genuine need. And it's a little bit like I'm an attorney and he's the jury. And I've got to convince him to act here because, you know, I'm not sure he's even paying attention, let alone cares about this situation. And so I've got to convince him or I have to kind of urge him, you know, Lord, please, Lord. Have you ever done that in prayer? Have you ever done the, had that kind of an approach where it's kind of like, God, please. You know, you know what you and I need to do when we go into prayer? We need to go into it understanding and realizing that God cares more than you do about whatever you're praying. And that His love is unmatched. We pray for people thinking that we love them more than God does. And we somehow got to convince Him of how much we love them so that He'll do something about it. You know, God, I just, I just love this person so much and it hurts so much to see him in pain. God, I just pray that you would... It's like, it's like God doesn't love him or something. I mean, that's what we kind of convey. And we've got to be really careful about that. Because many times in our prayers, our theology kind of shows through, you know? I mean, what we really believe kind of, kind of shows through. But I love that quote. If some of you tried to write that down, I'll send it out on Calvary Mail, okay? Because <laughs> I know some of you are going to come up after the service and say, I want that quote. That's a good one. All right, now verses 9 through 15 basically make up what we see or know as the Lord's Prayer. And um, we call it the Lord's Prayer because the Lord gave it to his disciples and so forth. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, we have it. We have it elsewhere in the Gospels. It's kind of, I see it as kind of a blueprint, a model, or a design for prayer. You know what's sad about the Lord's Prayer? It has become the very thing Jesus told us not to do with prayer. It has become a mindless repetition. Do you know that the, um, the late uh, J. Vernon McGee refused to pray this prayer in church? Refused to lead his congregation in this prayer because he believed that they would say it mindlessly, repetitiously, and in so doing would do the exact opposite of what Jesus was telling us to do. It was never meant to be recited. It was meant to be a guideline, a springboard, if you will, to teach us the kinds of things that we ought to emphasize in our prayer. And when it is used that way, it is used appropriately. When it is used as a mindless recitation that goes into the brain but bypasses the heart, it is used inappropriately. And so I've used the, the Lord's Prayer, and when I finally got a hold of this, you know, as a kid, I, I heard the Lord's Prayer recited many, many times. I probably had it memorized long before I was born again, long before I was saved. I could say the Lord's Prayer. Big deal. When I got saved and I started realizing that Jesus had given us a guideline for prayer here, I began to use it that way and I found it opened up prayer for me in ways that I never dreamed I could pray. Because like I said at the very beginning, prayer has always been a challenge to me. It's always been hard. Hard to keep praying, hard to stay on task, hard to, you know, it's like my mind wanders so easily. Doesn't yours? 
Some of you guys are like that. You're like me. It's like, Lord. Is that a bug? Or something? You know what I mean? It's just, you just, you just, you just, yeah. So having something like the Lord's Prayer gives us, you know, and then there's some of you that go, Lord. Right? And it's like, eyes open, I am asleep, sort of a thing. But So staying on task can be a real challenge. The Lord's Prayer gives us that. If you take the parts of the Lord's Prayer apart and kind of look at what they're saying and then meditate on those things and pray about those things, it's really, really helpful. Let me show you. I'll put the first part up here. The first part is our Father in Heaven. Now, it's so easy to say, our Father in Heaven. And, you know, we can all say it with that whole rote kind of, our Father in Heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are debtors. Lead us not into temptation. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing other things while I'm saying this thing. But Jesus wanted us to start off by addressing our God as our Father. And I think he wanted us to think about that. Do you know what I find interesting? I find that people who have a distant relationship with the Lord tend to refer to him more as God, and people who have a closer, more intimate relationship with him call him Father. Because Father is a family name. Some people would say, well, I can't call him Father because my own father was terrible to me. I'm truly sorry that's the case but you need to start learning that there is a good father in your life and start addressing him properly. He wants to show you what a real father is supposed to be like. And if you never let him in that place, you'll never be able to experience that. So Jesus says when you come to the place of prayer, come this way, Father. Not my earthly father, my father in heaven. And that springs into a whole bunch of other thoughts like, Lord, thank you that I'm your child. Thank you that I get to call you Father. Because not everybody does. He is not everyone's Father. He is the Father of those who have come to Him by faith and they have been made children of God. That doesn't happen automatically. It It happens as we come to Him. And activate that aspect of that relationship. So he wants us to think about that for a while. Father. You're my father. That makes me your son. That'll blow your mind. And then we go on in this prayer. He says, our our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed is probably not a word that you use every day. I'm just spitballing here, but I'll bet you that's probably true. I mean, you probably don't do that. Don't use those dishes. Those are my hallowed dishes. It it is a word that literally means to be set apart, to be made holy. And when we are told to pray that, we are actually saying to the Lord, Lord, let your name be holy. So we start off by saying, my Father in heaven, let your name be holy. Let it be holy in my life. Let it be holy in my family's life. Let it be holy in our church. Let it be holy in our nation. You know, well, the name of the Lord isn't very holy in our nation anymore, but we can still pray that. Lord, let your name be holy, you know. Isn't it funny, too, that the work of the enemy is to take the name of the Lord and to make it into a mindless, repetitious curse word, right? The name of the Lord is used as a curse word all the time. And some of us are guilty of having used it that way, myself included. But that's just the work of the enemy to try to take the name of God, which is so powerful, so glorious, and so holy, and to make it something very common. But holy means set apart, special. Lord, make your name special in my life, in my heart. My Father in heaven, make your name holy. Make it holy. He goes on, and... The next thing we find in this model is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I find it interesting that Jesus takes the idea of the kingdom of God and the kingdom coming 
and the will of God being done and merges them into one basic thought. And I think that's interesting because I believe it is one basic thought. You might ask the question, where can I see the kingdom of God in action? Where is it happening around me? Well, where you see the will of God being played out in, as people walk in obedience to God, walk in his will and so forth, there you see the kingdom of God. So the prayer that, that or this, this element of this prayer that we are to uh, convey to the Lord is I want to see your kingdom established in and around my life as your will is done. I want to see your will done. And so in my prayer time, I begin to think about all the things that need to come under the will of God. And you know, that can take me a long time. I can get stuck on this part of that prayer and just sit there for a long time. It's like, okay, Lord, that situation there, that family situation, Lord, I just, that needs to come under your will. My life, my, my habits, my, my addictions, uh, they need to be brought under the will of the Lord. I want to see the kingdom of God in my life so that I am not ruled by another king. You see, the kingdom of God assumes that there's a king, and that king is the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're praying, Lord, let your kingdom be established in my life. Well, that means I don't want to see the rulership of any other small K king in my life. Whatever that may be, anything that rules my life, Lord, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. He wants us to make that a regular part of our prayer. I need to give you these things, Lord, so that your rulership begins to really take hold in my life. Let your will be done. You know, let your will be done. What a great prayer. I've heard it said that it's the one prayer that will always get answered by God. Let your will be done. Wow. Sometimes, you know, you don't even know what to pray, do you? When something happens that's horrible and you, you, you know you need to pray, but you go to the Lord and it's like, I don't know. What do I say? Lord, let your will be done. This situation right here is just seemingly so out of control, so chaotic, so dysfunctional. Lord, let your will be done. Bring your will, bring your order, bring your peace into this thing, you know. He wants us to make that a part of our, of our daily prayer life. Praying for the will of God. Praying that the kingdom of God, and boy, let me tell you something, guys. The kingdom of God comes with a throne. And the rightful person sitting on that throne is Jesus Christ. So when you're praying for the kingdom of God to come, you're praying for the throne of God to be established in whatever area of life you're praying that into. And, you know, we all need that, don't we? I need the throne of God in my life more and more and more. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your throne be established in my life. You can spend all kinds of time praying about that. That's the essence of what Jesus wants us to pray. Do you see how much more meaningful it is than just saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We've all said that. We've all repeated that, haven't we? But have we ever stopped to think about what we're saying? And have we ever genuinely and sincerely invited the lordship and the kingship of Jesus Christ into those aspects of our lives that need him so badly? No, we've just mindlessly repeated something that we learned somewhere along the line. Exactly what Jesus told us not to do with prayer. Isn't that crazy? And then we come to the next element of this model, which says, give us today our daily bread. <clears throat> I love this part of the prayer, too, honestly, for a lot of different reasons. Bread, by the way, is a symbol of what we need daily to survive. Okay, you, you know, you, you need bread, you need, you need to be able to eat and so forth. But, but bread is something that goes beyond those things that I simply put in my mouth. Daily bread can be whatever I need today, whatever I need to survive, whatever I need to carry on today. And it might be wisdom. Maybe I'm facing a situation where I have to make a decision. So my daily bread today is, is, is wisdom and discernment. Maybe I'm facing a situation for which I'm not sure I have the strength and so my daily bread for today is strength, ability, the empowering work of the Spirit. You know, but I love the fact that he says, give us this day. And don't you love that he gave us that element of the Lord's Prayer? Because it reminds us that our petitions and our coming to him is to be done on a daily basis. Notice he doesn't say, Lord, give me this week 
my daily bread. Or give me this month my daily bread. Some of you guys may know who Gail Irwin is. He's a popular speaker in the Calvary Chapels. Fairly large man. I, I don't think he'd mind me telling you that. But he, uh, he jokes and he says that uh, if he prayed that God would give him his monthly bread, he'd eat it all in one day and then have nothing left for the month. <laughs> the point is, God wants us to keep coming back to him and keep depending on him on a daily basis. Do you remember in, 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 in the, the wilderness when the nation of Israel was wandering in the wilderness and God fed them miraculously? But how? Manna fell on the ground, remember? Every day. And if they tried to gather too much, if they said, well, I need to have some for tomorrow, by the next day, that manna was rotten and stinking and full of maggots. You know? And the lesson is very clear. No, no, no. I want you to come every day. I'm going to take care of you on a day-by-day basis. You need to look to me daily. Come to me daily. Don't pray once and say, well, yeah, I prayed. I prayed once. Well, what's God want out of me? <clears throat> he wants a daily relationship. You know? So give us this day. Give me today. That which I need to, to kind of get, get by and so forth. And next is, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, at this point in my prayer, I probably just kind of stop and I, I think about the things that I've done that have grieved the Holy Spirit. Things that I've said to my family, maybe things that I've, I should have done that I didn't do. Um, I just kind of take some time and even give the Lord an opportunity to make me aware of things that I may not be even aware of. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of listening. Maybe you take this time to say, Lord, is there anything going on in my life right now where I've grieved you in any way? Because I need you to make me aware of it so that I can confess it and ask for forgiveness. But notice that the forgiveness that I ask for is predicated here upon the fact that I am likewise going to forgive those who have sinned against me, who have a debt against me. Wow. Do you know what's really cool about this prayer? If you prayed this prayer, at least not, I mean, not in these words, not a vain repetition. If you used this as a guideline for your prayer every single day, you would not be able to, after a period of time, either keep praying this prayer or hold a grudge against somebody else. One of the two is going to go. Either you're going to stop praying or you're going to finally let go of that grudge and you're going to give it to God and you're going to forgive that person as you have been forgiven because you can't keep saying that sincerely from the heart and hold a grudge. But Jesus told us that the propensity in our lives is so great to be hurt and to nurture and nurse those hurt feelings that we need to come daily and confess this as sin. And tell him that not only do I need to confess daily, I need to release people daily. Because, you know, people hurt us, don't they? Sometimes they really hurt us bad. But, you know, if you're not releasing someone who has hurt you, it's not hurting that person, it's hurting you. And it's hurting your relationship with God. That brings one other quick question. Now this is important, and this came up in Refuge a number of weeks ago. One of the kids very wisely asked, if when I come to the Lord and, and, and receive forgiveness for my sins, you know, when I first come to Jesus, when I'm, when I'm born again, when I come to him and say, Jesus, I need you, please forgive me for all of my sins, Am I forgiven for all of my sins, past, present, and future? And my response is, yes, you are. And so his question then was, why then do we need to keep coming back for forgiveness? Why does he tell us to keep coming back and ask for forgiveness? Here's the answer to that question. Because sin, even though it cannot alter your eternal destiny any longer, because you now have the blood of Jesus cleansing and washing you, it can still break fellowship between you and God. And it does. Sin can still break fellowship. It cannot break the eternal bond that now has you a child of God. I mean, you're on your way to heaven. There's no doubt about that. But you, when you do things that grieve the Holy Spirit and you don't confess those sins, fellowship is broken between you and the Lord. Intimacy is broken. Everybody understands this, particularly people who are married understand this. 
If I do something that grieves my wife, saying something, doing something, not saying something, not doing something, our fellowship is broken until I go to my wife and say, honey, I'm sorry. I apologize. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Would you forgive me? And her response is, yes, I forgive you. Well, what, what just happened? We restored fellowship between the two of us. Now we can have a relationship again. We can talk. We can, we can get along the way we should. Do you know that your relationship with God has that same dynamic? Do you know that you can be a born-again Christian and have broken fellowship with God? People say all the time, I wonder, Pastor, why do I feel so distant from God? It's not, it's not God pulling away. You know, why does God just seem so distant sometimes? Hey, did you ever stop to think that maybe you broke fellowship with God by something you did and you didn't confess it? Listen, you're, it's not that you go to God to get saved again. You're saved. You're born again. You're a child of God. You're going to heaven. But your fellowship with God is broken. Your intimacy has been hindered. It's been interrupted. You've got to get that taken care of. Jesus said it needs to be a daily thing where I come to the Lord. Father, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. And listen, I'm going to make sure, and he'll tell us why in just a minute, I'm going to make sure that I'm forgiving anybody else in my life. Lord, if there's anybody in my life that I'm holding a grudge against, you make me aware of that right now because I'm going to bring it to you and I'm going to release them in the same way you've released me. Well, that's huge. I mean, nothing will make you crazier than holding a grudge. I'm serious. It'll actually make you weird. I think it twists people's minds and spirits and emotions in ways. If we could see a picture of someone who has been eaten up with unforgiveness, if we could see them in the physical realm, if we could see what they look like, there would be deformities that would cause you to gasp. On the outside, they can look wonderful. But on the inside, there is rottenness that needs to be dealt with. And we deal with it at the cross by coming to God and saying, Father, forgive me for what I've done as also I forgive those who have hurt me and wronged me in whatever way. And I release them. Not in my own strength, but in yours. And sometimes, you know, we have to admit, God, I can't do this. If somebody has hurt you badly, you may need to come to the Father and just say, Lord, I just don't have it. It's not in me to forgive this person. I'm just telling you, you know, as if he needed you to admit that. Right? You think he didn't know that? Of course he knew that. But he needs you to admit it. He needs you to come to him and, and be able to say, Lord, I can't do this. I can't forgive this person. And then God, you know what, guys, I'll tell you what he's going to tell you. I'll, I'll tell you what he's going to say to you. He's going to follow it up with the question. He's going to say this, are you willing? Because I'll do it through you. You just give me permission to come and breathe my heart, my will, my purpose, my love in your heart. And I'll give you the ability. I'll give you all the ability you need to forgive that person. You just give the word. I guess it depends on how much we want to be free. You know, do you want to be free today? Free of bitterness and unforgiveness. Literally, it will twist you and, and pervert your heart in ways that are just terrible. And then we go into this last part where he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And this is a time when I kind of just confess to God, you know, the weaknesses of my flesh. We all have weaknesses in our flesh. And we come to him and we say, Lord, you know, there are so many things in this life that are trying to tempt me to walk away from you. And so I'm asking you now, in the name of Jesus, to strengthen me to go the other way. Lead me, Lord, in the right way. Lead me away from those things that are going to be tempting in my life, that are going to lead me down the wrong path. Take me away from those, Lord. 
And then he also says that we are to pray for deliverance from the tempter. Isn't that interesting? You know, the way we've often said the Lord's Prayer historically is, you know, and lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. But you know that in the Greek, it is literally a personal evil. So the evil one is a correct translation of the Greek. The evil one. He's telling us to pray for deliverance from the devil. And we are to pray to God for that deliverance. We are to say to God, deliver me from the power of the enemy. Deliver me from his grasp. Deliver me from his schemes and his wiles and so forth. Do you know that it nowhere says in the Bible to talk to the devil? I don't talk to the devil. Why waste your time talking to somebody who is a liar? Talk to God. You know, he's the one we're supposed to talk to. You got problems with the devil? Talk to God. He's the only one who's not going to lead you astray. So you've got a problem with the enemy? Is the enemy harassing you? Father, deliver me from the evil one. That's what we're taught to pray. We're not taught to sit and curse the devil. That's charismatic weirdness, and it has no foundation in the Bible. Okay? So we go to God when we pray. We talk to the Lord when we pray. Lord, deliver me from the power of the enemy. Deliver me from... And, and, and this in your prayer time, you might begin to widen that as you begin to pray for other people that their lives would be free from the work of the enemy, that they might be delivered from the work of the enemy and so forth. Father God, lead this person away from those things that are tempting and, and, and deliver them from the enemy's constant hounding attempts to draw them down into their flesh and, and make them do things that they know is only going to ruin their lives. Deliver them from that, Father. You know, that's... The, the part of our prayer that is supposed to be activated, you know, that we're, we're doing real, true, spiritual uh, warfare and so forth. Now, the final two verses of the section, they provide kind of a deeper understanding, perhaps, of why we confess our sins um, before God. And he repeats here in verse 14, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, people, be careful here. Jesus is not giving a recipe for salvation. He's not telling you that if you want to be saved, you've got to forgive other people of what they've done. He's not saying that. Again, he's talking about relationship. If you are a born-again Christian, your sins are already forgiven for eternity, but your sins can still break fellowship with God, and God is saying that you will continue on in an unforgiven situation between you and him, which has broken that fellowship between you and he, if you stubbornly continue to maintain a broken fellowship with your fellow man. God is basically saying here, listen, if you are going to stubbornly refuse to forgive, then I am going to stubbornly refuse to forgive, and our fellowship will remain broken. And that's a sad state of affairs for a born-again Christian to have broken fellowship with God, to be literally unforgiven in an ongoing, day-to-day, -day, relational way. I mean, it goes against everything that ought to characterize our lives. You know, we are to be forgiving people. We're to forgive others the way we've been forgiven. We are called into a personal relationship with Jesus, but that relationship is predicated upon us forgiving as we've been forgiven. You can go to heaven and be a jerk, but you're going to be a miserable person. But God wants you to be set free and walk in the light of his presence. And to be able to convey that to the people with whom you meet. The only way you're going to be able to do that is if you're a forgiving person. Not forgiving in your own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the sooner we recognize that we're pretty much unable to forgive, the better off we're going to be. But we'll also realize that God will enable us to forgive. As if to answer one more question about why we should pray, I want to share one more verse before we end. And it's Philippians. I'll do it on the screen. Paul writes and says, Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests 
to God. And then what? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So why pray? The answer is right in, contained in these verses. Because when we do, when we lay things at his feet, God responds by filling our hearts with peace. Peace. When you lay it at his feet and trust him. Do you know, I didn't separate those two verses, but the last verse, verse 7, is, begins with the word and on the last part there. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you know I often hear that verse quoted all by itself? And people will say that. They'll say, hey, you need the peace of God. How come you don't have the peace of God? The peace of God. Haven't you heard about the peace? It transcends all understanding. It'll guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Why aren't you walking in the peace of God? Have you prayed about it? Did you ever notice that that peace is predicated upon prayer? It is a wonderful promise. I love this promise, but people understand that this is a conditional promise. The promise is conditioned on the fact that you take things to the throne of God and you lay them there and you offload your anxiousness and you offload your requests and you offload the burdens of your heart in such a way as to say, Lord, I can't carry these things anymore. They will kill me and I just can't, I can't live this way. So I'm going to bring this to you, and I'm going to trust you with this situation, and I'm going to let you be Lord of my life. Now guess what happens when I really truly do that? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, begins to guard my heart and mind from the onslaught of the enemy who wants to come back and say, yeah, but it's your responsibility. You, you, you got to do this. No, no, I'm seeing my, my heart has a guard set because I go back and say, oh, I've given it to God, and I'm going to trust him with it. I've done what he told me to do. Don't be anxious. But in everything, prayer, petition with thanksgiving, bring it to me. Bring it to me. And I'll take care of you. And I will see that there is a guard placed upon your heart, a guard of peace. And that's one of the other great reasons why we pray. Because we need his peace. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to close in prayer, and I'm going to ask that our prayer team come down and, and ready themselves to just pray with people for whatever needs are going on in your life. Um, we, uh, we make these people available for you just in case you may not know of someone to pray with. If you do know somebody else to pray with, grab them if these guys are busy. There's nothing you know special about any one of us. We are together just servants of the Lord and wanting to bring things to the throne of grace. But, um, but praying is such an incredible privilege that we've been given by God. I mean, to literally enter the throne room of God with our petitions and requests. What a privilege. Let's make sure that we don't, you know, forget it and ignore it, neglect it. Luke chapter 11, verse th uh, 1 through 13. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and get you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you if his son asks for a fish will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. We're going to be looking at the content of prayer, the persistence of prayer, and we're going to be looking at the object of prayer. Before we get into the first point, which is that, that issue of the, the content of prayer, I want to look again with you at verse 1. Look in your Bible with me again, because this is where it tells us that Jesus was praying. And when He had finished... And I think that's significant. One of his disciples came up to him and, and asked him, 
to instruct them in the area of prayer. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt that you needed help with your prayer life? Yeah, I know. Stupid question. Because I, I, I think it's probably a fairly universal need. I think we all <laughs> recognize that our prayer life could, you know, stand, you know, some improvement. But um, I think that it's significant that this request made to Jesus about prayer came right on the heels of him praying. Because here he is doing it. He, and, and, and the disciples saw that in his prayer time, that is when he connected. That is when he communed. That is when he, he filled up on that relationship with the Father uh, for all that he was called to do. And, you know, they, and they wanted what he had. I don't know if you've ever looked at another Christian and kind of thought, man, I want what you've got. But that's the way they were thinking about it. And I think that the disciples are kind of a reflection of all of us as it relates to this need that we have in our hearts, you know, to be better at prayers, you know. I, 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 like the disciples, we all know that prayer is important. And that's why they came and asked Him to help. But they also knew that they were struggling, you know. They knew that, that I, I'm just not getting the job done. It's just not working. Str prayer is a struggle. Prayer is hard work. I think we can relate, all of us, to long periods of prayerlessness in our lives. I know I can. Even as a pastor, there have been too many seasons where I have not prayed as I ought. And so, these vi Bible verses, and this, these, these sections here in Luke chapter 11 are given to us to help us get on track. And, 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 and I think that these important points that Jesus is covering are all critical. So let's highlight the first one that we're going to look at. And that is the content of prayer. And you'll notice in verse 2, Jesus began to say to them, When you pray, say. And, then you, and, and he goes through it. And, and Luke gives us kind of a shortened version of it. But you know, we all recognize this as the Lord's Prayer. And, and, and probably every single day, Christians gather around the world to recite the Lord's Prayer, which I believe is not at all what He intended for it. I don't think Jesus gave us this as something to recite. This is, this is an outline, you guys. And an outline is meant to kind of be a guide, if you will. It, it, it emphasizes key points that were to cover. But I, I don't think Jesus meant us just to stand in, in, you know, in one place. And you know, you, 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 we've all probably learned the Lord's Prayer. And you don't have to even think about it. You know? Our Father, who art in heaven, how... And most of us even do it from the King James. You know? I mean, how long ago was that, that we learned that? And it just kind of rolls off the tongue without really even passing through the mind. Let alone making its way to the heart. That's not at all what, what, what Jesus meant when He gave us this. He gave us this outline to say, when you pray, pray this way. Begin by addressing the Father. Notice it begins with Father. That means He wants you and I to remember that when we begin to pray, we're talking to a person. And I know that sounds like kind of a duh moment, but sometimes we forget it. Sometimes we kind of divorce God from just a person. I mean, He's God, after all. And it's like, how do you begin to talk to God? Well, you talk to God like any other person. But the point about this is that prayer time is meant to be a personal time. It's a time of intimacy. It's a time of communion. It, 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 it's a time of connecting. We're talking to our Father. And I think that way too often as Christians, we forget the fact that only those who are born of God even have the right to call Him Father. Do you know that? Have you ever noticed that when you're talking to people who don't know the Lord, they don't call Him Father usually. They use all kinds of dumb things like the man upstairs or the big guy or, or something dumb like that. But, but Father is a, is a term of endearment. It's a term of intimacy. More than that, it's a term of family. It's a term of family. And you know, while we were taking communion, I even quoted that passage from John chapter 1 that says, to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, 
He gave the right to become children of God. Do you understand, Christians, that it's when we become children of God that He becomes our Father, and not before. Before that, He is just your God. He's your Creator. But there, there becomes this important dynamic that, ch that changes. It shifts when you and I come to know Christ in our hearts and we receive what He did on the cross. He, God becomes our Father. And we begin to speak to Him on that personal, intimate level. Father, I come to You. And, and, and none of, notice that Jesus didn't give us all these fancy adjectives that man over the years has, has added you know, to addressing God. Oh, great, holy and high. You know, not that He isn't deserving of every holy adjective that you can add. I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that this is a prayer of intimacy. And, and, that's, and that's an important thing to remember. And then after addressing Him as Father, we're to say, hallowed be Your name. And again, that's not something to be said by rote memorization, because hallowed means holy, or set apart, sanctified. And when we say, holy be Your name, we have to remember that in antiquity, the name of somebody meant everything about them. To you and I, you know, we think of names as, you know, we look up online or in a book, you know, what does my name mean? Well, my name means, and we love it when it says something nice, you know, my name means courageous, you know. That's not what my name means, by the way. Um, Paul means little. I'm serious. Yeah. Paul means little. Um, yeah. Thank you. But that's really about as far as we kind of go when it comes to understanding the meaning of the, a person's name. But in, in, in Bible times, to say you must receive the name of Jesus, it meant you had to receive everything about Him. It means every declaration, every, uh, every, every word that He spoke, everything that He is, is bound up in His name. That's why it says in John, to those who received Him, him the, to those who believed in his name to those who believed in everything about him he gave the right to become children of God right so when we're saying to God hallowed be your name or holy be your name we're just saying holy are you holy are you God and you know we remember that it is the angels in that's that that are before the throne of God who are constantly Day and night we're told, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Constantly. And I understand that holiness is a concept that, that, that you and I have a difficult time laying hold of, but we are to begin our prayer time magnifying the Lord. And when we declare His holiness and even meditate on the fact that He is holy, we are doing just that. Then we come to the second point that we're going to be looking at here, which is the persistence of prayer. And, and it is my considered opinion, which frankly isn't worth anything, but it is my opinion that for those who do pray, um, this is probably the biggest challenge that most Christians uh, face. Persistence, consistency, staying at it, you know, not giving up uh, in prayer. And, and, and Jesus, to make this point, tells a very simple parable about a man who goes to his neighbor asking for some bread to help feed an unexpected guest who had just arrived at a late hour. And in the story, the man who is awakened uh, is initially unwilling to help out. He's like, hey, what are you doing, man? We're all in bed and lights are off. And, you know, what are you talking about, bread? Just, you know, I'm not going to give you anything. And, and, uh, and yet it tells us here, that in, in verse 8, that although he, he's not going to get up and give him anything because they're friends, he will get up and actually take care of him just so he can go back to bed. Now, that's an example. And it, and, and it says, because of his impudence, which is an interesting word that's translated that way here in the ESV, um, it literally means, check this out, it means shameless persistence. I like that. Because of his shameless persistence, this man will ultimately get 
what he needs. And it's talking about the determination to knock and keep knocking. I mean, to the point of being obnoxious about it. And, and the whole promise here from this verse for our shameless persistence is summed up in verses 9 and 10. Look with me in your Bible, verses 9 and 10. He says, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, let me ask you a question. How long does Jesus say you have to ask, seek, and knock before you get what you're looking for? He doesn't say, does he? And yet we all have, in our minds, in our hearts, we've got this idea of how long it ought to take. And we pray... And when we get to our expectation of how long it ought to take before God answers, we just say, well, there you go. I prayed and nothing happened. I prayed, God didn't didn't answer. Yep. Big deal, huh? Yeah. So much for his promises. I pray. And uh, people, people have never been quite that obnoxious about it when they say it to me, but I have had people say to me quite often, well, I prayed. And the inference is, Nothing happened, pastor. You know? Is there a warranty on this thing? Because I think I have a refund coming. He doesn't say how long to pray. He says just, he just, it's just keep praying. And, and because, guys, this is one of the most glorious promises in all the Word of God, to be completely honest with you. But so... Few believers are ever willing to lay hold of this promise because they will not pray with shameless persistence. You know, there's an old Puritan saying that goes like this. Pray until you pray. And I like that. What they're saying is pray and keep praying until you're really praying. And the truth is, Can I just say that I think, as Christians, most of us don't get past the ground floor of prayer. I know there are some here who have a gift of intercession, and we love you, and we need you in the body of Christ. But for the rest of us, we struggle to get past first base as it relates to praying and really praying. And too often, our prayer time resembles a hit-and-run accident rather than a real time of communion and intimacy and connection with the Father. You know, I, I, I found a quote. Let me show you this on the screen. D.A. Carson wrote this or said this. or He said, if we pray until we pray, eventually we come to delight in God's presence, to rest in His love, to cherish His will. In the Western world, we urgently need this advice. For many of us in our praying are like nasty little boys who ring front doorbells and run away before anyone answers. I thought, man, boom. He hit it, didn't he? Yeah, you know, it's like... And that's what people are often saying when they come. And they say, well, I rang the doorbell and ran. You know? It's really important, you know, persistence in prayer. Shameless persistence. Keep praying. Pray until you break through. There have been some occasions in my life where I've prayed until I broke through. And I can tell you that there's nothing better than breaking through. There's nothing better than meeting with the living God in a breakthrough of prayer. I wish I could could stand up here and tell you that every time I pray, I do that. But I can't. I wish I could. And I would say it, except I know that God would strike me dead where I stand. Finally, our third point that we're highlighting here, which is the object of prayer. And and this is an important thing to remember because, you know, the object of prayer, when we talk about the object of prayer, we're talking about the one to whom we are praying. And that is really one of the most important points about prayer, um, as Jesus goes on to explain. If you look with me again in verse 11, he begins to ask, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will, you know, instead of a fish, give him a serpent? 
Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. So he, he gives us these rather bizarre examples to kind of highlight the, the difference between the character of our heavenly father with our earthly human fathers. And, you know, we all know that earthly human fathers, and I'm one of them, we've been corrupted by the influence of sin. But even with that corruption, when our kids ask us for something, you know, that they need, we still give them what they need. And his point is, by comparison, here's God, who is not corrupted by sin, who is perfect in compassion and kindness and love and wants the absolute best for you. He says, listen, if you guys are willing to do good things for your kids when they ask you, how much more can you expect God to bless you and give you good things? That's what he basically says in verse 13. Now you'll notice that Luke uh, you know, says, records it as, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You know, this was something Jesus repeated on several occasions. He also repeated this idea on the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew records it there. Let me put it on the screen for you from Matthew 7. He says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So, whether he's giving us good things or giving us his Holy Spirit, it's all meant to reinforce the point that God responds differently than earthly human fathers. Because, you see, he's never mean or bad-tempered or in a hurry. He's certainly never cruel. And Jesus wants to communicate to you and I that it is God's character that is our highest motivation to come to him in prayer. You get that? If I was going to go ask something of a cruel ruler, world ruler, and I had a, a very important request, but I knew that this individual almost always turned people down and or tortured them if he didn't happen to like them, I probably would be pretty hesitant about going before that individual and laying my request at his feet. In fact, I might even say, you know what, I don't think it's worth it. I think I'm just going to kind of forget it. He's going to say no. I wonder how many people think that that's, like, that's what God is like. I'm not even going to ask because I, he's probably just going to say no. How sad is that? And what Jesus is trying to communicate to you and I is that the, the character of God, if we would but know that character, we would, we would be drawn to the place of prayer. We would come running to the place of prayer. We couldn't wait to get into His presence to talk to Him about our needs if we really, truly understood His character. And His absolute love for you and I. Let me end with one final thought about prayer. And it comes from Acts chapter 9. And I'm going to put it on the screen for you. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. These words that you're seeing there, and, I, and let's leave them up there for just a bit if we could. They were spoken to a man by the name of Ananias. Ananias lived in Damascus, and he was being told to go and find a man named Saul of Tarsus and to pray for him. But what Ananias wasn't told was that God had met Paul on his way to Damascus, and Paul had seen the glory of Jesus. And that glory was such that Paul was blinded, knocked to the ground. But more than that, Jesus revealed himself to Paul in that, that meeting, and, and he did it in such a way that Paul was now a broken and repentant man for the way he'd been living. 
So instead of telling all that to Ananias, instead of giving him all this information about Paul, now let me explain, Ananias, what's going on here. He gave one qualification for why Ananias should feel fine about going to do this. And he said this, for behold, he's praying. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Paul was praying. So during this time when he was blind, and we're told he didn't eat anything during that time, he was praying. So was that a big deal to Paul? I mean, I want to remind you of something about the Apostle Paul before he was the Apostle Paul. He was a very religious man. You know, from the standpoint that he strictly observed the law of Moses, we know that he was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, he would have kept the regular Jewish calls to prayer three times a day. He would have gathered with other people to pray. So, yeah, Paul was no stranger to prayer and the demands of prayer. But here's the clincher. Even though Paul was accustomed to spending time in prayer, he remained a stranger to the one to whom he prayed. Crazy, isn't it? You can pray and not know God. But something happened in Paul's life, and that's when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he was revealed. To, it was revealed to him who Jesus was, and, and on and on and on. And, and that was when that religious man, Saul of Tarsus, that was when he died. And that was when the new man, the man that we would come to know as the Apostle Paul, the broken man, the repentant man, the new man, was born. And it was about that new man that God said to Ananias, Behold, he's praying. You know, I, I got to tell you something. I, I get a lot of requests, and I bet you do too. I get requests to say prayers for people or for situations. And they actually word it that way. They'll say, Pastor Paul, would you say prayers for such and such? And I'll be honest with you. I don't ever want to just say prayers. Because saying prayers is empty religion. It's what Saul used to do. He did it because he had to do it. And I really want no part of it. <laughs> As children of God, we don't say prayers. What we, and, and that's not what we need to do. What we need to do is break through. What we need to do is we need to cry out from the depth of our souls to God. We need to commune with Him in intimacy and brokenness. And, and we need to pray until we pray. I'm, I'm done saying prayers. i got to be honest with you. I don't even like it when we get into a public gathering and they ask me to pray because I'm the pastor. I really don't like that at all. Because what they want me to do is perform a ministerial function. And I'll be honest with you, I hate it. It's like you pray. <laughs> you know? Hey, pastor, you want to say a prayer? No, you do it. <laughs> Sometimes I'm bold enough to say that. Other times I just go ahead and pray. But I don't like it because I don't want to say prayers. You know? It's not what I'm interested in doing. Prayer is more than that. It's not a religious exercise. It's either going to be the cry of the heart or it's going to be nothing, you guys, because... The cry of the heart is, is the cry of intimacy. A son or a daughter to their father that says, Lord, I need you. I need you now. And I'm not going to make it without you. I got no time to say religious prayers. And frankly, neither do you. It's time for us to start crying out to God, because I tell you something, I want to be a person about whom God says, behold, he is praying. That's the kind of man I want to be. I'm not there, but that's the kind of man I want to be. And I hope that's the kind of person you want to be.